Hey, y'all, this is Hogan Gidley. Today, Chad Wolf and I talk with the vice chair of AFPI's Center for American Security, Fred Flights. We're going to discuss the ongoing war in Israel. Welcome to The Tank. Coming to you from our nation's capital, this is The Tank, your voice in Washington, D.C. and around the country. Broadcasting from the America First Policy Institute offices in D.C., this is the premier think tank podcast where we discuss the challenges facing our nation, talk policy, and advance America First solutions. Welcome to The Tank. Hello, this is Chad Wolf, And this is Hogan Gidley. Hogan, we're going to mix things up uh, today. Uh, for those of you that follow The Tank, uh, normally we talk about a couple of different issues before we bring on our guest. Obviously, our issue today is a very serious issue, so we just want to bring on our guest right away. He's an expert in this field. Uh, he's going to give us some great insight. Uh, so we've got Fred Flights uh, here with us today. He is the vice chair for AFPI Center for American Security. But probably most importantly, he's got over 25 years in the national security field with positions with the Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, State Department, House Intelligence Community, and then, of course, during the Trump administration was the chief of staff for the National Security Council. Uh, Fred is steeped in all things uh, Middle East, Israel, as well as a number of other things. So we're really, really blessed to have uh, Fred here today to break down a very difficult issue, but a very serious issue. So, Fred, welcome to The Tank. Good to be here. Hey Fred, we want to start here because I think it's very important for the listeners to kind of grasp how we got here. So what events led to the serious significant situation we see in the Middle East, and then talk about kind of next step. So first things first, just kind of break down how we got to this So th th this moment that, that matters so much to the world. Well, on October 7th, uh, the Hamas terrorists launched uh, an act of genocide, an act against the Israeli people, against the state of Israel that was worse than anything since the Holocaust. 1,300 Israelis were killed, many of them brutalized and tortured and raped. Uh, it has really changed the dynamics of security in the Middle East and, and across the world. We now have a situation where Israel knows that it has to destroy Hamas. It understands that this is an organization that is determined to not just destroy the state of Israel, but to kill all the Jews who live there. And we have to be very clear when we're talking about this, not shy away on what this actually amounts to. It's also a moment that we have to have absolutely no daylight between the United States and Israel on, the, on this existential threat. Israel is one of our closest allies, the only democracy in the Middle East, and it is absolutely certain when they are facing uh, this existential threat that America stand very, very uh, closely with them. Concerning how the attack began, I think there's no question that Iran was behind the attack. We know Iran gives about $100 million a year to Hamas. We know it provides weapons to Hamas. There was a Wall Street Journal article just after this attack took place uh, that said that Iranian leaders uh, okayed and gave a green light to the attack just before it occurred. That that account has been disputed that since then. Now we're, we're hearing accounts that Maybe Iran didn't know it was going to take place, but was complicit because it's been arming Hamas. I think we will see a smoking gun eventually that Iran did order this attack, and it did it to try to ruin America's relationship in the United States, its leadership, and to sabotage efforts to normalize relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Israel's now moving to, to taking Gaza City. It's moving systematically. Through, is, through Gaza, knowing that it is full of booby traps and, and, and snipers, Hamas knew that Israel was coming. And uh, we're seeing concerns that this could be a much broader conflict with Hezbollah, which is Israel's terrorist proxy in, in, in Lebanon, firing missiles across the border, but not fully entering the conflict. So it's a complicated uh, uh, conflict. It is a conflict that needs strong support from the United States. And uh, I, I regret it will probably be on this war, I think will be ongoing for several months. That's a, that's a great, great recap, Fred. Uh, you mentioned Iran, uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. And I know you've done a lot of work in this area, particularly the Iran nuclear deal under President Obama, and of course uh, the payment. I think it was about six billion dollars the payment to Iran by President Biden uh, shortly before the attacks that you just described. 
Talk a little bit about what is the mindset of the administration? <laughs> it's almost as though they want to cozy up to Iran, but yet they don't really understand the threat. As you laid out in chapter and verse, the amount of financial support that they provide terrorist organizations like Hamas and, and Hezbollah and others, what do you think the mindset here is? Well, why would they do that, right? I mean, I think there were a number of policymakers here in town, America First individuals, yourself and, and others, who said this was not a smart idea, and they have since frozen those payments. And the question is, do you need an act of genocide like we've seen to bring some rational thought to your, your foreign policy? would love to get your thoughts on that. Uh, these are important questions. From the very beginning, the Biden administration reverted to the Obama administration's approach to treat Iran as, as a partner and to assume that we could form a multilateral alliance that would use Iran for a partner in the Middle East. Now, Obama made this mistake with his disastrous 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, the JCPOA. Uh, there was massive Iranian cheating, and President Trump made the right decision in pulling out of this agreement in 2018. Uh, as we know, Joe Biden has tried to reverse as many of President Trump's policies as possible, and one of them was to try to get back into the JCPOA and to loosen sanctions on Iran, thinking that this would encourage Iran uh, uh, to strike a new nuclear deal. Well, that didn't work. Iran never negotiated in, in earnest. And although we gave Iran an increase of billions of dollars in revenue by not enforcing oil sanctions, this money didn't go to help the Iranian people or to uh, promote stability in the Middle East. This went to weapons, Iran's missile program, and supporting terrorists around the world. Now, you mentioned this $6 billion payment that was promised to Iran yep. in August. This was ransom paid to release five innocent Americans. It, and, and the administration says this wasn't ransom because this was Iranian money uh, being held in a, in a South Korean bank. Well, here's the deal, Chad. If we arrange to have money paid to somebody to release hostages, that's a ransom payment. You of can dance. You can right. dance yeah. around whose money it was. That we got the money to Iran. The good thing is, well, maybe it's a good thing. The money was sent to a bank in Qatar in August, and it hasn't been released yet. Supposedly, the administration froze this payment because of bipartisan outrage over the Hamas attack and reports that Iran was behind it. So I think about eight days ago, the administration said that this $6 billion has been frozen. Uh, but my guess is it's been frozen temporarily, and this administration yeah. has not given up its de determination to appease Iran and to keep pushing for a new nuclear deal. Okay, so so much of what we worked on on the the Paris uh, not Paris Club, sorry, uh, the Abraham Accords, so significant of that region, and one large factor was we kind of recognized reality, Israel's ability to exist, but also that we rallied the region around a common enemy in Iran which had never really been done before. This is obviously the largest state sponsor of terror. Uh, their stated goal, Hamas, Hezbollah, others, to destroy Israel, wipe it off the map, kill Jews, destroy the West, kill Americans, uh, destroy the United States. When they tell us they want to do these things, why do so many on the left and why do so many in Washington not believe them? And, and that's related to a, 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 an outbreak of anti-Semitism and, and protests on our college campus against the state of Israel and Jewish people, Jewish citizens uh, being harassed, threatened, hiding in, in library conference rooms. And one has to wonder, like, where did this come from? How, how could it be that the left will not recognize Hamas as a terrorist organization? And... This goes to a growing problem on the left in the Democratic Party. In 2012, for example, Barack Obama tried to add moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem to the Democratic platform at, at a meeting. It, it, it wasn't the convention, and he was booed. Now, to Obama's credit, I, I often don't give Obama credit, he insisted that it be put in the platform. Not that he was sincere, sincere about it, right. but that's a box-checking exercise that every president until Trump said they would do and didn't do. And didn't do, right. Then in 2016, at the APAC conference, the, the uh, America-Israel Political Action Committee conference in Washington, there were about 12 presidential candidates for the Democrats at the time. Not one of them spoke to the conference because of hostility towards Israel by the far left of the Democratic Party. 
And we're seeing that, that evil, that rot percolate to the surface right now. We're seeing it on the left, we're seeing it in protests, we're seeing it around the world, we're seeing it on university campuses where there are professors who are teaching this nonsense. And I, I did a, a podcast with David Friedman, who was the ambassador who negotiated the Abraham Accords. Right. And he said, look, this is all about anti-Semitism, hatred of Israel, that's true. But a lot of these young protesters, they can't spell the word Israel. They're morons. They're basically left-wingers who are following a left-wing agenda that's anti-American, that's that's against modern society, and it has resulted in in this in these heinous demonstrations against Jewish people in the state of Israel. They don't know, and what's frustrating is it's almost as though people on the left, people in Washington, some of these college kids think if you just gave them a Starbucks and iPhones, they'll all be happy with us. That's not the way this works. There's a deep-seated hatred there, and when you see these videos popping up on college campuses of the hate-filled rhetoric toward the Jewish people, it, 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 it's weird how that one class of citizen somehow isn't protected at all. If you did that to any other group, you'd be laughed off campus, you'd be kicked off campus, you'd be censored, you'd be sanctioned, all those types of things. But it's okay for some reason to do it to Jewish people. And I, I can't understand why these college campuses allow this type of stuff to continue. I mean, these teachers, it didn't just start. I mean, these, these teachers had to learn this from somewhere. So this has been going on for decades, right? But when you see the people, I, I saw a person recently go up in a video and say, would you sign this, this petition to stand up for Palestine and Hamas? And every one of them said yes. And they said, okay, well, I want to read a few of these oh, addendums I saw, I to saw it. That too. Yeah. This is I want to read a few of these great. addendums just to make sure we're on the same page. They say, well, you, you stand with us on the eradication and destruction of Jews. And they're like, wait, what? And they said, we also stand for you know the killing or jailing of all homosexual. And they were like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. You can't let women... A drive. You can't let women out in public. They have to cover their head and their ankles, and if they don't, you can put them in jail or stone them. And they were like, wait, what? They had no, like you said, they were stupid. They had no idea that was part of the package here of Hamas. So what do you do to begin to educate people on this important topic so you understand the evil you're dealing with? Well, let's say up front, there are organized Far left groups, there are Palestinian groups who have infiltrated academia, have infiltrated left wing organizations. That's why there were huge numbers of buses who, who brought po uh, protesters to Washington last weekend. This didn't just happen. This is an organization that's been working behind the scenes, working against the state of Israel with the knowledge of university administrators for a long time. But I, I think that we should, we should say, well, there's supposed to be speech codes on our college uh, campuses. There's supposed to be safe spaces. There's supposed to be microaggressions that our students are protected against. Uh, we hear that black lives matter. Don't Jewish lives matter? Mm -hmm. There should be speech codes to protect Jewish people, Jewish students. These rules are already on the books, and the college campuses aren't enforcing them. But I would go further than that. We, we hear about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We need on college campuses diversity of thought. We have to have conservative or at least moderate professors to counter these far left uh, professors. In some political science departments, they're all far left liberals. Where do the students go to learn about this country, our history, America first? Uh, I mean, there's a lot to this problem, and, and I think we have to demand change. Well, I think it's not only just pro-Palestine groups on college campuses that maybe have, have popped up, and as you indicated, maybe they didn't pop up, but I think this is a... This is a larger issue with academia, right? These are college professors that have been, perhaps they are years and decades that are far left. Some are, I should say, even Marxist, and they advertise that they are. And they ingrain this into their students. And these are the same students that are now showing up on these college campuses or elsewhere that are very young, right? You know, they're in their early 20s, maybe late 20s that have been indoctrinated in academia by these professors and others. And to your point, Fred, um, it's because they don't have that diversity of thought. They're only getting spoon-fed, I should say, one perspective and one view. And I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think the really hard thing that, we, that overall that we have to deal with in this country is that, that protected First Amendment, right? People can say what they want to say. We don't have to agree with it. I don't agree with large amounts of what people mm -hmm. say. But when you have students fearing for their life, Jewish students on college campuses, 
or there's violent attacks, you've now crossed the line. You've now gone beyond just freedom of speech. And the fact that college administrators or university administrators and others aren't taking some aggressive action, I think it just continues to invite more and more of this. And we're going to see more and more of this, particularly when we have a president who won't really speak out against it. That's right. The college departments have to be depoliticized. I know of uh, political science departments where every professor is teaching intersectionality, uh, 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 DEI, uh, the fact that all the political science department books are written by dead white males. I don't care if that's taught, but there should be some diversity so the students can function in the real world. What, what I really thought was, was so sad about the letter that was signed by these Harvard students, most of whom did not read it or didn't know what they were signing, uh, uh, condemning Israel for the terrorist attacks, is that these are the students of the future who are going to be yeah, academics, right. they're going to be reporters, they're going to be running for office. And these are just the ones that we know of. There's, there, 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 there are millions of them, and they really have been indoctrinated, Chad. And I think let's say we have some some people who contribute to college colleges on this on this. I'm sure some of them listen to to your podcast. Oh, um, I'm sure all of them. Do. I'm all yes. I'm all for not funding these universities, but I think these donors should say, "I'm not going to give any more money to you until there's intellectual diversity." There should be professors who are teaching what Israel's really about. A conservative Jewish professor on many of these universities. There should be someone who wants to teach what really happened in American history and America first approach to national security. This could be done. And I think the donors should say, you're not going to get our money if all of it is going to be this woke nonsense that you're teaching these students. At the very least, how about not funding a college or university that allows terrorist sympathizers to go around threatening the very lives of other students? It's one thing to call a man who thinks he's a woman a man. It's another thing to go around and say, from the river to the sea— Palestine will be free, which is obviously a direct threat on, on, on Israel and, and Jewish lives. But one thing I want, uh, you're, you're, we're getting to a point here where I think this is important moving forward. As Israel begins to move into Gaza, and this thing heats up in a way that, that I don't think too many in the West are prepared for, uh, the moral equivalence part is really making me very frustrated right now, what we're seeing in the mainstream media. So when Hamas goes into Israel, as you talked about right off the top, and kills 1,300, 1,400 Israeli citizens, the rape, the murder, burning of babies, all these things, and we don't have to guess what happened. They posted it online as like a feather in their cap. So Israel seeks to minimize casualties, and Hamas seeks to maximize casualties. They do so, though, as Israel begins to make its move forward here. You mentioned it briefly off the top, but hiding military weaponry, installations, tunnels, etc., under civilian targets is a direct violation of the quote-unquote rules of war of the Geneva Convention. The Red Cross calls this out. You can't do those things. So while loss of life of a child is a horrible thing on, on, on either side, one side is using that child as a shield, and that's part of a, a bigger problem how significant is that piece that Hamas is doing? And how do you think the American people, the American media, et cetera, will perceive what's going on? Do you think that moral equivalence is going to continue as we move to this? And then they're going to call for kind of a, a, a pause again, as the administration did. And one more thing before you answer this, I was just thinking, it's almost as though Hamas attacks... Israel starts to respond, Hamas uses citizens, and then everyone says, now there's a pause. It's like you're incentivizing using human shields. You're incentivizing bringing in civilians. So talk a little bit about that. These are very important questions, and let's just talk about humanitarian law and the laws of war. And I have to talk about the Biden administration, so this is a good chance to, to mention on that. Um, you know, President Biden has said, we're expecting Israel to abide by the laws of war and humanitarian law. Well, we know that Israel does abide by those laws. We know Hamas knows that too. That's why it puts its military headquarters under hospitals. Right. That's why it puts the entrances to its tunnels under hospitals because Hamas knows Israel won't bomb hospitals because it's against international law. And and I, I give President Biden credit for all the positive things he said about Israel and for, for condemning Hamas. But when he says things like that, 
uh, he's giving ammunition to uh, Israel's enemies. When he says Israel can't occupy Gaza, when he says we have to go back to the two-state solution, this is not a time for daylight between the United States and Israel or between the American people in Israel or the American people and the Jewish people around the world. We have to stand strong. But what we're seeing here, Hogan, is that Joe Biden is facing a, 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 a catastrophe on his left because there are so many people on his left who are demanding a ceasefire, who do see this moral equivalency, and we can see that Biden is starting to go wobbly. I hope he won't, and there are a lot of Democratic members of Congress who are stalwart supporters of Israel, and they're telling him not to, but you can see this is happening. You know, these humanitarian pauses the administration is ca- calling for, they are one-sided ceasefires where Israel will stop fighting and Hamas will not, and Prime Minister Netanyahu said, no, there's not going to be a ceasefire until Hamas gives up the hostages. And he's saying that because this is such a dire threat to their existence. He's not going to give Hamas opportunities to rearm and to attack Israel again. Well, I'm, you know, God bless you, Fred. You're giving, you're giving the president some credit. I, I give him almost none uh, because why well, I hear his words, his leadership, and everything that you just said kind of says the opposite. And I think back to, you know, when you when when someone is victimized in the press and whoever starts talking more about uh, the victim and what the victim should be doing and less about the perpetrator and call them out for what they are, you know, in that, in that case, a criminal, it's almost the same thing that's going on here. It's let's talk about what Israel should and shouldn't be doing. Let's talk about, you know, are they adhering to the rules of war? Are they doing this? Are they doing that? Let's talk about the terrorists here. And, and and what they are not doing, obviously, they don't abide by any of those rules. And it's almost it, it's it's this odd dynamic that you continue to put the pressure on Israel, who, you know, as I've heard said elsewhere, there was a ceasefire. It was October 6th. Yeah. That was the ceasefire. That's right. Right. Um, and when someone breaks it uh, and we've uh, you know, you've heard about shortly after 9-11. What if there was a call from the international community to say, guys, it's now, you know, September 20th. I need you guys to do a little ceasefire here before you start uh, getting aggressive with, you know, uh, the folks in Afghanistan and elsewhere. We would have said absolutely not. You are absurd. We're going to protect Americans, um, and there's got to be consequences to people that do this type of barbarism. And so, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Fred. I, you know, I, I hope the administration does the right thing. It's just by their actions, the fact that they're saying, "Hey, we need this pause." Yeah, I every agree. little pause helps Hamas. It does not help the state of Israel. It does not help the Jewish people. I God, I hope we get all the hostages back, uh, but we're in a, a weird state now, and they've got to figure that out. But you're in the middle of a war. Bad things happen. Um, they're not an ocean away from Israel like you know we have here in the United States. They are miles away. I, I guess I, I, I regret I judged President Biden with a very low bar, and he could be worse. And Remember, Biden went to Israel recently to supposedly to state his support for Israel, but he really went to Israel on the condition that there be a humanitarian pause by Netanyahu. Right. I thought this was reprehensible. But look, Netanyahu has known Biden for decades, and his job is to maintain a strong relationship with the United States, work with Biden for the support that he needs to get. But I will tell you that when Biden presses him for ceasefires and humanitarian pauses, Netanyahu is not going to let the United States determine its national security policy. He's going to maintain good relations, and you have to give him credit for the patience he's had with with Biden. But Netanyahu, he knows Biden well. Yeah. Okay. Um, Obviously, we're to a point now where the full-scale move into into Gaza really hasn't occurred. They've been bombing certain things. Uh, We also know that the reason this is taking so long is because Israel does care about civilians. So they don't want to just indiscriminately start dropping ordinances on this place. They want to make sure they do it the best way, the most, you know, decent way possible. So what what really happens next? Uh, because they have been doing some bombings. Tell us why they did those bombings ahead of time, Israel into Gaza, and then what will this look like when they move in with their their military? Israel knows that Gaza is an enormous trap. There's booby traps, there's tank traps, there's snipers, there's underground tunnels, and it's moving slow and systematically to defend its troops 
and to defend civilians. And uh, many of the bombings were to prepare the way for its troops entering the territory. There's bunker buster bombs that were targeting tunnels. You know, a lot of people think that Hamas is invincible because of these tunnels. I got to tell you, the Israelis have been preparing for these tunnels for decades. They have sophisticated efforts to attack them. There's this kind of chemical they put in that will seal a tunnel instantly. It's like this expanding foam. They have robots that are going into these tunnels. Uh, they're, 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 they're attacking the power sources that are necessary to pump air into these tunnels, the, the fuel, diesel generator, diesel fuels for these generators. But they're moving slowly because they have to do it right, and they're trying to, to avoid loss of life. But the question you ask that's really, really difficult is what comes next? After Hamas does not control the territory, after it's wiped out, what comes next? Right, right now— uh, Netanyahu, I think he said today that he sees an indefinite military occupation. The Israelis would like Arab states to contribute to a process to try to get control of the territory. There's been talk of maybe uh, Arab peacekeeping forces. I don't know of any Arab nation who, that wants to do that. It's a real problem. Now, there's talk about, well, why don't, why don't the Gaza refugees go to another country? Well, we know why that is, because through history, when they've gone to Jordan, when they've gone to Kuwait, when they've gone to Iraq— uh, they've caused political no, problems. They them. try to overthrow the, 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 the king of Jordan when they were there. <laughs> right. They've caused trouble in Egypt. No one wants them because there are terrorists. They're, they're, they have caused instability where they've gone. And it's terrible because most of these people are not terrorists. But we know in the list of people who have been listed for humanitarian release over, over the last few weeks, Hamas has fighters in the list to leave the territory for medical treatment. Uh, it, it, it is a real and long-term security problem. I don't know what the answer to it is. I don't think Israel is knows either. But one thing they're not going to tolerate is Hamas will not be ruling this enclave for one day longer as a terrorist safe haven. And they've had it since, what, 2006, 2005? I think 2005, yeah. Right. So the question also becomes if they're such a great force and they're such a great government, quote-unquote, why is everyone in abject poverty? Why, you know, what are they doing with all this money they're getting? They're spending it on terrorism. And I think yeah. I think if there's one thing we saw from COVID, of course, I would argue that we saw um, parents who got to look behind the curtain and see what our kids were learning in, in uh, school, in, in grade school. What I think we see with this is in in college, parents are taking a look and going, wait a minute, I'm paying for my child to learn this. The, the world, the America is taking a look and going, wait a minute, we're teaching our kids this? I think it, it it's an eye-opening situation in both instances that I think will have long-term lasting positive effects um, on the, the future of, of this country. Yeah, let me just circle back, Fred. I think these are all good points. I did want to bring up, you know, one thing when we, we were talking a little bit about college campuses earlier. Um and we talk about the anti-Semitism that we hear and some of the protest. And I think it's funny the, the what you actually hear um, is not necessarily, you know, let's, you know, you don't have pro-Palestine being saying, let's talk about a two-state solution. Let's talk about how we can coexist. That's not what they're saying. They're actually targeting people because they're Jewish. Um, and, and, I think that is something. I mean, we, Hogan mentioned it earlier. It's always kind of been in the background, but you know, I I don't believe that our country is systemically racist as as some on the left do. But I have to say the the amount of anti-Semitism and others here that I've seen recently because of the events has shocked me a little bit. I I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought that you would have seen this on college campuses like we see today in such large numbers banging on the White House fence and gates that we saw just a couple of nights ago. Um, is, is, it, is it shocking, or has that always just been around but sort of suppressed? There's been a, a, a level of anti-Semitism and Israel hatred that has been growing on the left for a long time. But I think a lot of this simply shows how gullible and poorly educated many students are at these universities. Yeah how they're going along with a movement that they don't understand. Many of them don't know where Gaza is. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, it, it just shows we yeah. have real systemic problems with what these kids are being taught. Yeah. It, 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 it's a deconstructionalism, deconstruction mentality. Is that of, a word? Yeah, sure, why not? It's the word that basically connotes a system in which these college kids are learning anybody with power 
must be oppressing somebody. So they must tear them apart as opposed to wondering yeah. why those people are oppressed in the first place. What did they do? What was the issue? Yeah. Which is a whole other topic. But I, I did want to talk about this before we begin to, to wrap up. 38 airstrikes on U.S. bases so far. Um, what does this mean? As, in the as Middle we, East. In the Middle East, right. yes. What, what does this mean for us looking around going, all right, we're going to stay out. This is Israel's war. But all of a sudden, people are launching ordinances into, into our installations uh, in the Middle East. What does that do? There have been over 110 attacks on American bases in Syria and Iraq since this administration began. There have been 38 since October 7th and about eight since last weekend. The U.S. has responded to five of them. About a week ago, the, we responded to the recent attacks that occurred in October with two strikes in Syria basically against empty buildings. This was an incredible response, and there was a large number of attacks after we did this. And, and basically, I think Congress and the administration has to decide if we're going to keep American troops in Syria and Iraq we have to protect them. About 45 American soldiers have been injured. There was a contractor who, di who died of a heart attack. Uh, there has to be an aggressive response. Again, and these are Iranian-backed militias attacking. The leadership of these organizations have to be targeted. Their headquarters have to be destroyed. If we're not going to do that, we have to pull our soldiers out of these vulnerable locations. It's just quite remarkable. Uh, I mean, Fred, those are those are, you know, eye-popping numbers and you just think back to an america first approach to foreign policy national security or and just security around the globe and under this administration all of, all of those tax and those numbers you just mentioned we've we've basically given up five different embassies around the world yes um we have abandoned afghanistan in that just humiliating withdrawal from kabul um, obviously, we're in a situation that we find ourselves in. The, the southern border is wide open, again, you know, providing some risk to, to our national security. It's just, I think the approach, the America first approach versus what you have today, I think they are so, they stand in, in, in such stark contrast to one another. I think it's very clear where, you know, I think most Americans would want to see the country go. Uh, yeah. at the end of the day. America first means a strong U.S. military, the, the prudent use of military force, keeping us out of unnecessary wars. But it also means peace through strength. Yeah. And we know that when America is seen as weak, it emboldens our enemies to try 100%. stuff. It makes the world so much more unstable. And we have not had a president this week in, in our history, which is leading to this incredible outbreak of, of instability with China, with Russia, yeah. with Ukraine, with North Korea, and now with Hamas against Israel. It is it is such a serious time right now, Fred, and you and I flew around on Air Force One a bunch. I didn't, I, I mean, it bears to say, I just didn't realize how much policy mattered. And you take a look at the current administration and the policies they've put in place that have not protected the American people. They don't put uh, America first, but... I heard someone qu quoted the other day, and I thought this was a fascinating quote. What they said was, I know we're closing out here, Chad. Just calm down. You're getting very excited. Well, no, I, I'm getting excited that you didn't think policy mattered before. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, I, mean, look, I, I, I mean, what's but going what on? I, but what I'm saying is I didn't realize the, the, the ripple effect it has across the globe when you have um, feckless foreign policy. But someone, I, I don't remember who said the quote, but they said it was a someone from another country made the point. It turns out that whoever the president of the United States is doesn't just matter to the United States. It matters to the world. And I think we're seeing the, the, the reality of, of someone in office that has negatively impacted the American people. Yes. But also people around the globe as well. hundred percent. Yeah. Great. Well, Fred, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, sharing your obviously expert analysis on the situation in, in Israel. Uh, what America's doing, really how we should respond. We covered a lot of ground today, so I really want to thank you for being here. Good to be here. All right, folks, make sure you subscribe today so you don't miss any of the upcoming Tank episodes. Text the word TANK to 70107. That's TANK to 70107 to get exclusive content from the Tank Podcast and to learn more about the America First Policy Institute.